Okay. All right, you guys. So um, again, uh, what we're doing is we're, we're working on innate nonspecific host defenses. Last time we had discussed surface defenses, skin, and mucous membranes. And today, folks, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss nonspecific innate um, defenses interior. So what happens if the microbe penetrates the skin or the mucous membranes by some injury, maybe like from surgery, maybe an injection, something like that. So folks, um, so what we're going to talk about then today is inflammation, um, phagocytosis, fever, complement activation, and interferon. And it'll be very superficial. Again, folks, I'm just really glad most of you have had a &P or will have it, and they do a really fine job of exploring immunology. So we're, we're doing just kind of the surface, just giving you a little taste of it. So folks, the, the, first, the first thing we're going to talk about then is inflammation. And inflammation is our body's reaction to any kind of injury. Now, we're going to look at inflammation as a response to microbial invasion, right? But folks, even if you were just to damage your cells, like I'm just using my fingernail to cause a little bit of tissue damage here on my wrist, just that tissue damage without any microbes is going to trigger an inflammatory response. And we have classic signs of inflammation. Um, eventually, and actually, it's already getting red, you guys. Redness, called, also called erythema. Um, eventually, it'll be swollen. I'll have edema. Um, eventually, it'll be warmer, right? I'll have an in increased temperature. And it's already starting to hurt. So we have these classic signs of inflammation, folks. And we want to find out why they occur. And, you know, what is it that's going on in inflammation that's part of our defenses? How is it helpful? So again, folks, we have redness. We have um, heat increase temperature. We have swelling. And we have pain. So these are some of the classic signs of inflammation. So um, what's happening to describe this, folks, is um, in response to chemical medi mediators that are released, and we're going to just call them in general inflammatory mediators, we see some changes going on, specifically with our blood vessels. So in response to those inflammatory mediators, we're going to see an, uh, vasodilation, right? And as a result, we're going to have an increased blood flow locally where the damage is. And that's why you guys, like right now, this area is appearing redder. It's because of the vasodilation and increased blood flow, right? So my blood's red, so it appears pink or red. And furthermore, you guys, that increased blood flow is responsible for the increase in heat, right? The hyperthermia there, yeah. And then furthermore, folks, in response to the release of those um, chemical messengers, those inflammatory mediators, our vessels become leaky. And as a result, fluid, the liquid portion of blood, is going to leak out of my blood vessels into the surrounding tissues, the extravascular tissues, and that's what causes the edema or the swelling, yeah? And then furthermore, you guys, in response to those inflammatory mediators, my pain receptors are getting activated, right? So, and, and, and you guys, I know this is a philosophical question. We could say, what is the purpose of pain? But, but there is a biological survival reason, you guys. So let's pretend... What I did was I actually gouged my arm with this pencil or a stick, right? If I'm just do 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 do, right? I'm not paying attention to say, oh, I need to change something here, right? I need to pull that stick out, right? I could have even more damage. So we could argue that pain is a signal that tells us something needs to be changed, right? Something needs to be altered. Okay. So folks, what we want to do though, now we kind of have this overview is we want to explore, well, why is this protective? Why is it part of our defenses? Okay? And folks, I, I love this little cartoon here, and I don't want to get too far away from the microphone. But let me see if we can walk through this cartoon, folks. Let me first just read the text that goes along with this cartoon. right? So folks, here we have um, a section through skin, and here we have like a, um, a, a splinter, a stick. It could be a rusty nail penetrating through the skin layer, right? So now we're into interior defenses. So as a result of the um, tissue damage, you guys, and here we have introduction of microbes, so we have microbial invasion. In response to tissue damage and the invasion of the microbes, those inflammatory media, those chemical messengers are going to be released. So as a result, you guys, we have blood vessel dilation, right? The blood vessel diameter gets bigger, and they become leaky. 
Now, the way they become weak glucose, this is like a little capillary, our finest little blood vessels. And the capillary walls are made up of these single layer of what we call endothelial cells, yeah? So in response to those inflammatory mediators, not, a, not only do the vessels get bigger, but these endothelial cells, they retract a little bit. They pull in a little bit. And that's what causes them to become leaky. Now, the leakiness is important. So first of all, folks, we're going to talk about how we want cells of our immune system, our white blood cells, our leukocytes. We want them to be able to escape from the blood vessels, and we want them to move into the area where the microbes are invading so that they can um, hopefully initially magnetize them and destroy them. So getting the, the vessels leaky, it aids them in being able to squeeze between these endothelial cells. And furthermore, folks, we'll be talking about um, antimicrobial chemicals that are in the liquid portion of our blood. We're going to talk about complement. Um, later on, we'll be talking about antibodies. So by having the vessels become leaky, that will also increase delivery of these antimicrobial um, compounds into this, the site of infection. Right? Okay. And then, folks, you might ask, well, you know, this is so cool, right? We're seeing our white blood cells. They're squeezing their way between um, the endothelial cells, and they're moving towards where the microbes are invading. We might say, how does this happen? And it's amazing, you guys. So in response to those inflammatory mediators, the endothelial cells, they express new surface molecules. And our white blood cells, our leukocytes, have receptors to bind to those new molecules. So what we would see, folks, is the white blood cells in this area, they would start binding to the walls of the blood vessels. And that's called margination, when they're binding to the, the margins, the walls. So if we're looking at, let's say these are phagocytes, you guys. <clears throat> And our professional phagocyte, that's our first responder, these are like our first responders, our EMTs, our neutrophils. So let's use neutrophils, you guys, as our example. So if we were watching this area um, of microbial invasion, we would see the leukocytes sticking to the walls of the blood vessels near where the microbes have invaded. And that's called margination. And then you guys, this is the coolest thing. Then what they do is they squeeze between the endothelial cells, and that's called diapodesis, or another term, you guys, is transmigration. They're leaving the blood vessels and moving into the um, extravascular tissues where the microbes are invading. And then, folks, they're going to use the concentration gradient of the inflammatory mediators, the concentration gradient of microbial products to guide them to ground zero, right, where the microbes have invaded. What do we call movement along a chemical concentration gradient? Awesome, you guys. Chemotaxis. Awesome. <coughs> right? And then um, they arrive at the scene of microbial invasion. And then what we're hoping, you guys, is that those neutrophils will quickly be able to phagocytize and destroy any of the invading microbes. Right? And we'll have a whole other slide, you guys, excuse me, discussing the process of phagocytosis. Right? So again, folks, one thing that is a huge advantage with inflammation is that we're going to create the chemical signals that will um, cause the blood vessels to become larger, increase blood delivery to the area, let them become leaky, right? We're going to increase the delivery of blood for oxygen and nutrients. Now, it'll help get rid of maybe some toxic products here. We'll increase delivery of white blood cells to the area of invasion. Right, the leaky vessels and the new receptors on the, the walls of the vessels um, help the leukocytes bind and then move into the tissues um, using chemotaxis. They'll discover ground zero where the microbes are invading, and then they'll try to phagocytize them. And furthermore, you guys, if the neutrophils can't kill all the invading microbes, those same signals will assist other white blood cells to arrive at the scene of invasion. And you guys, the, a second really important phagocytic cell um, these neutrophils, they're fast, but they're short-lived, right? They're our first responders. But another important phagocytic cell, you guys, they're slower, but they are longer-lived. Um, second to arrive would be macrophages, these great big eating cells, yeah? So these guys are slower, but they're longer-lived. And another important key, you guys, with macrophages is that they help trigger the, what we call the um, adaptive, 
acquired specific immune responses, such as antibody production. So they're kind of a bridge cell between nonspecific innate defenses and the specific adaptive acquired defenses. So if I ask you on the exam, you guys, what's a cell that's involved both in the innate nonspecific defenses and um, adaptive acquired defenses, a macrophage would be a great, great example. Okay? All right, you guys. Um, so let me see here. Have we missed anything? Okay. All right. So you guys, that's, that is inflammation in a nutshell. Okay. So we're just, we're going to keep, keep going here. Okay. And folks, um, this was information from the, the official textbook for the course. Um, so all what I want to share with you is I won't ask you anything on inflammation that we haven't just talked about. Okay, so there's some more details here. But if there's new vocabulary there that we haven't mentioned, don't worry about it. Okay. And again, this is just this is like some added information from your um, from your textbook. But again, if we haven't talked about it, you guys, I'm not going to ask you about it on the lecture exam three. Now, folks, this is really important, um, chronic inflammation. And this is a great example of, again, I keep using this term, you guys, the double-edged sword of the immune system, right? We can't live without it, right? We absolutely have to have it to protect us against invading microbes. But the consequence of some of our immune responses um, can be tissue damage. Our immune responses can actually harm us, right? And so you guys, chronic inflammation, meaning inflammation that continues for a long time, can cause a lot of tissue damage. And indeed, you guys, there's a lot of research into diseases like vascular disease, atherosclerosis, some cancers, um, some of the neurological diseases like multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease. Um, many people feel that chronic inflammation actually plays a role in pathogenesis, right? So again, doing more, well, can cause harm, right? Um, and this is especially true, you guys, when inflammation lasts for a long, long, long time. And we'll discuss why. What's, what are some of the problems with chronic inflammation here? Okay. And this, folks, was just a reminder me that when we were talking about endotoxic shock or um, sepsis or septic shock, really endotoxic shock, sepsis, is an inappropriate inflammatory response, right? Um, for inflammatory responses to be really beneficial, we want them to be localized, right? Right at the scene, say, of microbial invasion. We just want local vasodilation, local leaky blood vessels. But you guys, like with, when endotoxin is released, the endotoxin binds the cells of the immune system, and we get massive amounts of inflammatory mediators released. And so, some, some people refer to those inflammatory mediators um, as part of a family of what are called cytokines. So they talk about a cytokine storm. Our body gets flooded with these chemical messengers. Our body is flooded with inflammatory mediators. And so as a result, you guys, instead of having localized vasodilation and leaky vessels, what happens? We have vasodilation and leaky vessels everywhere. And you guys, what impact will that have on our blood pressure? It's going to go down, right? And what impact will that hypotension, low blood pressure have on um, delivery of blood to our organs? Goes down, right? And you guys remember an endotoxic shock, we're also going to trigger the clotting cascade, so we end up with disseminated intravascular coagulation. We start to have blood clots everywhere. What does that do to blood flow to our organs? Further goes down, right? And remember the irony, you guys, of DIC? We use up all of our clotting factors. So what happens when we use up all of our clotting factors? We, you start to bleed out. You start to hemorrhage, right? So you, you can see how um, the endotoxic shock, the septic shock, it can be um, rapidly fatal, right? Because of, of the decrease in blood flow to the, to the organs. Okay, so you guys, you don't need to memorize that concept map, but it's just to show you all the things that go wrong, right, when we have an inappropriate body-wide inflammatory response. So folks, um, what we're next going to do is take a look at some of the details of phagocytosis, right? So we talked about an advantage of inflammation is that we're going to attract um, white blood cells, including the phagocytes, the scene of microbial invasion. And the two phagocytes, you guys, we often call them professional phagocytes, the neutrophil, the first responder, and then our macrophage, right? So let's take a look at a, a diagram, you guys, of the surface of our phagocytic cells. 
Now, because remember, folks, here we're talking about innate nonspecific defenses. There's no antibodies involved here, right? So we're talking about uh, phagocytes that somehow can recognize invading microbes and ingest them without the help of antibodies around, right? So it was really exciting, folks, when um, the researchers started to discover that cells of the immune system have these special receptors for unique microbial products. Unique microbial products, products that we don't make, right? So you guys, um, does it make sense that cells of the immune system might have receptors for LPS, lipopolysaccharide? So if lipopolysaccharide binds to one of these receptors, it's a signal that we're being invaded by gram-negative bacteria, good. You guys, what's flagellin? The protein that makes up bacterial flagella. So this is another, another clue that we're being invaded by bacteria, maybe some place where they shouldn't be, right? So cells of the immune system have receptors for flagellin. Um, you guys, in gram-positive bacteria, would pexidic lycan be a unique bacterial yeah. substance? Yeah. Would tycoic acid be a unique bacterial mm -hmm. substance? Yeah, right? In mycobacteria, you guys, um, maybe this is mycolic acid. Maybe it's a unique carbohydrate in those acid fast cell walls. And likewise for fungi and yeast folks, there might be unique carbohydrates in the cell walls of the fungi, um, to which our white blood cells have receptors. So again, without antibodies, if our um, white blood cells bind to those substances, that's the clue that we're being invaded. It's going to help trigger protective immune responses. In any case, you don't have to remember this name, this pattern recognition receptors. That's what these unique um, receptors for microbial, microbial products are called. But uh, a family of those pattern recognition receptors that you probably will hear quite a bit about are called the toll-like receptors, TLRs, right? And you can see here, folks, they've identified different toll-like receptors, and they give them numbers, that identify specific unique microbial compounds, okay? So, for example, when we're talking about maybe the arrival of our neutrophils or macrophages, if they have the toll-like receptors, it can bind to the unique products of the invading microbes. That's how they can attach, right? And can start the process of phagocytosis. Or they can release um, important chemical messengers, right, that help trigger a protective immune response. Okay, folks, so this is our kind of our overview of phagocytosis. So again, folks, let me just walk through it. Oh, and you guys, on your study guides, on um, page one, I've put some bullet points there, kind of key words um, um, that we want to know for inflammation. And then you guys, on page one, you'll see it says phagocytosis. There's kind of like key words, um, important vocabulary words that you'd want to know for the um, lecture exam three, okay? So folks, um, first of all, if you're talking about phagocytosis, how do the phagocytes know where the microbes are? What's the, the process they, that they use to find the microbes? Good, chemotaxis, exactly, you guys. So chemotaxis. And then, folks, the phagocytes have to attach to the surface of the microbes. So attachment is so important. So the phagocytes have to have receptors that can bind to something on the surface of the microbe, right? So you guys, do our phagocytes have receptors to bind to bacterial capsules? Nope, right? That's why the capsules um, are described as antiphagocytic. If a bacterium has a capsule, our phagocytes try to grab them, but because the phagocytes don't have any receptors for those capsular polysaccharides, the encapsulated bacterium just slides right out of their, their pseudopods, right? So that's why those capsules are such important virulence factors for invading bacteria. But you guys, let's presume that our phagocyte has receptors for some surface molecule on this invading microbe, right? So um, we have attachment, and then folks, those false feet, those pseudopods, they can form around and fuse around the microbe, or we can have invagination of the phagocytic cell membrane. The goal is the phagocyte wants to bring this invading microbe into the interior of the phagocyte in a membrane-bound vesicle. And folks, like in biology, we always have fancy names for things. So these membrane-bound vesicles are called phagosome. Some means body. Phago means eating. So these are literally the eating body. But you folks, this, this is not that great because 
a lot of microbes are really happy living in the phagosome, right? Um, so the phagocyte has to have some strategies to kill the invading microbe. And we're going to talk about two different strategies, you guys. Um, oxygen independent and oxygen dependent killing. So let me just erase the board so we can put up these two types of phagocytic killing. <coughs> So the phagocytes have two strategies for killing. Okay, and one is called oxygen-independent killing. In independent killing. <laughs> And the other one, you guys, is called oxygen-dependent killing. And this, uh, this strategy is often referred to as the oxidative or respiratory burst. And we'll describe why. Okay, so you guys, let's first tackle this um, oxygen-independent killing. And this is killing through... Um, the use of hydrolytic lysosomal enzymes, and we'll talk about what's a lysosome. Lysosomal enzymes. And folks, these enzymes, and again, we'll come back to it, they're acid activated. So we'll, we'll use the cartoon folks to describe what we mean by lysosomal enzymes and acid activated. Okay, so folks, in our phagocytes, um, we've got our phagosome, and now we want to turn our attention to these membrane-bound vesicles in your phagocytes called lysosomes, lysine bodies. And the reason they're called lysine bodies is they're chock full of hydrolytic enzymes, proteases, nucleases, lipases, right? So they can digest the invading microbe. So folks, what we'll see is the lysosome will fuse with the phagosome, forming what's called a phagolysosome. It's kind of like German, where you just keep adding words together, right? And it's in the phagolysosome the killing will occur. Now, to me, you guys, what's so fascinating is the lysosomal hydrolytic enzymes, they're in an inactive state, right? When the lysosome fuses with the phagosome and dumps those hydrolytic enzymes in there, the interior of the phagolysosome, it has to have a low pH. That's when the, lysis, the hydrolytic enzymes, they refold into their functional conformation. They become active. They start digesting the microbe, right? So how, how will we make an acidic environment inside the phagolysosome? It's amazing, you guys. There's proton pumps in the membrane. Proton pumps that pump hydrogen ions, protons, from the cytoplasm into the phagolysosome. What's going to happen to the pH? Decreases, right? And at that low pH, those inactive hydrolytic enzymes, they refold into an active um, uh, conformation. And then they start digesting the microbe. Isn't that amazing? Now, folks, um, that does not require any additional oxygen. And that's why it's called oxygen-independent killing. We're, we're just going to try to digest the microbe, right? But we see often in our immune system that there's always a backup plan, right? What if the first strategy doesn't work, right? You want to have a backup plan. And to me, you guys, I always think of it like if you're fighting an opponent, right? You're getting attacked, right? And you throw one punch, and then you want to throw another punch. So hopefully your opponent will be um, disabled. Maybe the first punch doesn't knock them out, right, or cause them to run away, but the second punch will. So you guys, we can think of this oxygen-independent killing, the hydrolytic lysosomal enzymes, as the first punch to try to kill the invading microbe, but we want to make sure we're going to kill those guys. And that's where this second punch, the oxygen-dependent killing, comes in. Now, what folks have observed in laboratories when they're studying phagocytes, there'll be this huge increase in oxygen consumption. Right? And that's why this is often called the respiratory or oxidative burst. And the reason is, okay, so we'll put a big increase in O2 consumption. And the reason is the phagocyte has enzyme systems that take the molecular oxygen 
and convert it into those toxic reactive oxygen intermediates. And you guys, you might remember that two of those toxic reactive oxygen intermediates were the superoxide anions or radicals, the free radicals, and it's just molecular oxygen with an extra electron. Very damaging, damages all kinds of organic molecules. And another one, folks, was why do we run, what do we run the catalase test with? Hydrogen peroxide, good. So hydrogen, your cells, your phagocytic cells, produce that toxic reactive um, hydrogen, hydrogen, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, right, to help kill the microbes. So you guys, this is the second punch, right? If the hydrolytic enzymes don't kill it, then by golly, I bet you those reactive oxygen intermediates will kill the invading microbes. So does that make sense, you guys, the one-two punch? Amazing, absolutely amazing. So folks, the goal then is for the phagocyte to kill the microbe, right? And so we have it digested, maybe the phagocyte absorbs some of the um, organic molecules as nutrients, but then you guys, we're gonna have this waste vesicle, right? Chock full of, you know, digested microbe. So the phagocyte needs to get rid of the waste, so the waste vesicle fuses with the cytoplasmic membrane and dumps all the waste into the um, external environment. But you guys think about this. What also will be inside um, that waste vesicle? What else is going to get dumped out into your tissues? Yeah, the hydrolytic enzymes, they're activated, right? And what else? Those roids. So you guys, so this is a great example of in chronic inflammation when we have invasion of a microbe and our body is not successful at destroying them and they live and they replicate Right, and so we have continual uh, attraction of phagocytic cells, and they're doing their best. They're trying their best, you guys, to destroy to destroy the microbes, right? But the longer the phagocytes are there, trying to kill, the more of um, the hydrolytic enzymes are getting dumped, more of those toxic reactive oxygen intermediates are getting dumped into our tissues. And will those enzymes and ROIs harm our tissues? Yes, they will, right? So this is part of the problem with chronic inflammation. And furthermore, folks, um, a couple of my favorite microbiology authors, they always give the microbes in the cells personalities, which I love, of course. And they talk about phagocytes being sloppy feeders. Sloppy feeders. So what do you mean a sloppy feeder? Well, it turns out in phagocytes, sometimes the lysosome won't fuse with the phagosome. It fuses with what? the cytoplasmic membrane, and it dumps those hydrolytic enzymes into the exterior, right? And you guys, if this was, say, like maybe an abscess, right? Usually in abscesses, the pH is really low. So those hydrolytic enzymes, they'll be activated, and then they can start digesting us, right? They can, again, contribute to tissue damage. So again, folks, and I keep saying this, but the double-edged sort of immune system can't live without it. But in many cases, the immune system is actually going to contribute to tissue damage um, when we suffer from infectious disease. Yeah, it's just wild. Okay. Oh, yeah, and one more thing, folks, on the side here. Do you remember when we were talking about bacteria that can live outside phagocytic cells or live inside phagocytic cells? Do you remember the term we use to describe such bacterial pathogens? Facultative? intracellular pathogens or parasites, right? Okay, so remember you guys, we said salmonella, um, Yersinia pestis, um, let me see who else, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, yeah? So those little guys have figured out strategies of how not to be killed in the phagocytes, and indeed you guys, they actually live in the phagocytes and they replicate, right? They replicate inside, and that's bad news because sometimes the phagocytes go traveling Right? So these infected phagocytes can actually then help spread the phag the, excuse me, they can actually help spread the bacteria to other parts of the body. Right? So again, the cell sent to kill actually becomes a delivery vessel, right? Vehicle, you know, helping to spread the pathogens around your body. What we'll do, folks, hopefully we'll have time um, next Thursday when we talk about specific adaptive immunity, we'll talk about how there's chemical messengers. Um, cells of our immune system can produce to help activate the phagocytes, to turn them into angry killers so that they can kill those facultative intracellular parasites. Yeah, okay.
So, folks, the third um, interior nonspecific um, innate defense we're going to talk about um, would be fever. So fever is an increase in core body temperature. And so, folks, what do we call substances which can trigger a fever? Pyro, pyrogens, right? And you guys always remember pyromaniacs like to set fires, right? So think of pyromaniacs, pyrogens. These are substances which trigger fever production, right? And folks, at least in the old days, we were taught about exogenous pyrogens. Exogenous meaning made outside of our body. And then we talk about endogenous pyrogens, um, substances that are made inside our body that will trigger the fever. And you guys, I'm just going to just refer to the slide here. So the classic <laughs> example, in the old days at least, of an exogenous pyrogen was endotoxin. So you guys, endotoxins are pyrogens, right? They're going to trigger cells of our immune system to release endogenous pyrogens. And folks, you don't have to remember the examples of endogenous pyrogens up there. You don't have to memorize that. But they include tumor necrosis factor, TNF, um, interleukin-1, interleukin-6. And again, these are chemical messengers made by cells of our immune system. Those particular chemicals are what we call endogenous pyrogens. They circulate in our blood to the brain where they trigger, and you guys help me out here, is, it's the hypothalamus is the thermostat of our bodies. Is that correct? I hope. Okay, right. Where those chemicals trigger the hypothalamus to reset, like, the thermostat of our body, to set it at a higher temperature. And then what our body does is it goes through changes to increase our core body um, temperature, right, to produce a fever. And that can include, you guys, vasoconstriction of blood vessels in the periphery to reduce blood flow to the periphery to reduce heat loss, right? Right, so we're going to try to main, uh, try to conserve as much heat as possible. Another thing, you guys, we might start to do what? Shiver, right? Because shivering, the muscle contraction generates heat. Yeah, you guys, what would be a behavior, behavioral change that that you might undergo? If you if if you feel cold, like I feel cold right now, you guys, what do I want to do? Yeah, I will, yeah, like a behavior change, you know, that I have control over. Yeah. Put layers on, right? If I could, maybe stay home, crawl into bed. Yeah. Um, if I could, maybe turn up the thermostat, right? Yeah. Because these are all ways to, that will help our body conserve heat and increase the internal temperature, right? But you guys, it's like, well, what, what, what's that all about? You know, why is that protective? So it turns out, folks, some microbes um, are inhibited from replicating at those higher temperatures. Not all, but some of them. Like, you know, the temperature starts to climb. They don't do well replicating, right? So we can inhibit microbial replication. And furthermore, folks, remember we talked about the inflammatory mediators, and we talked about the hydrolytic enzymes, and we talked about the enzymes that make the reactive oxygen intermediates. What will happen to their reaction rate is our temperature increases. It's going to increase, right? So you could argue that the chemicals that help kill the invading microbes, right, will be more efficient at the higher temperature, right? So now here in the United States, we don't like to feel yucky, right? So if I start to develop a fever, what might I do? Grab a antipyretic. What are antipyretics? Yeah, drugs that will reduce or inhibit fever production, right? And the, the most ancient one is aspirin. And then there's others. This is just a few, you guys, ibuprofen and acetaminophen. But, you guys, I want to propose something to you. If we evolve fever as a part of our defense, if we are healthy, right, you guys, healthy, like you guys, healthy young people, right, and you, you develop a slight fever, not a really high fever, do you want to reduce it necessarily right off the bat? You might not, right? Because if the fever, if, if there's been natural selection for our ability to um, mount a fever to help protect us against invading microbes, are we short-circuiting kind of that protective strategy by quickly taking the antipyretics? Yeah, I mean, and again, you guys, it's so, it depends on, like, how healthy you are, right? If this was a little child or an older person, you know, the, the extremes of age, we don't do thermoregulation well, right? Um, 
I, you know, I would be very worried about letting a fever rage in a very, very young child or baby or, a very, or an old person, like, without calling you guys, my healthcare providers, and say, the temperature is this, what should we do, right? But there are many indigenous cultures where heat has been used as a way to maintain heat or to treat illness. Think of saunas, think of uh, sweat lodges, right? Those are, those are um, ways that empirically um, um, people have discovered can help maintain health or help treat illness. And, I, and you guys are spot on, right? People call it folk medicine, but so often in folk medicine, it's like the benefits are real, right? And it's been discovered, observed from experience. But again, folks, I just want to stress that certainly in those at high risk, the very young, the very old, anybody that's immunocompromised, you know, I'd always want to be in touch with my healthcare professional to make sure the fever's not getting too high, right? Because there's definitely times to use antipyretics. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we get, are we all right with that one, folks? Okay. Now, folks, the next one, the complement system, this could be a whole two-hour lecture by itself. So you guys, I'm going to try to do it really superficially, and sometimes that makes it harder to understand. Okay, so complement, you guys, kind of the, um, some of the key points on complement are at the top of page two, okay? Just, again, kind of the key, key words here. So this is going to be the complement system light. Okay, so we often refer to this as a system because it's not one chemical, it's it's a system of over um, 30 proteins. Okay, so the complement system is called a system because it involves many different proteins. So maybe over 30 different complement proteins. And most of them are made by the liver. And this is why, folks, when you have uh, patients that have liver disease, um, part of their natural innate defenses are going to be because if their liver isn't able to make the complement proteins, we're going to see it really decreases their ability to defend themselves against microbes. So most are made by the liver. And they're circulating, folks, in our body fluids. So extracellular fluids, um, lymph, blood. So in body fluids, in an inactive state. Right? And you guys, this is, again, really, really simple case. So let's say this is some, uh, a generic complement protein. And I'll show it as a globular protein like this. And I'm going to put a little dotted line here and put a little A and a little B. So that's inactive. So to activate it, I cut the protein into two pieces. So we're going to end up with a complement component A and a complement component B. These are the active complement proteins. And what I mean by active is that they have biological functions. Okay, They have biological protective functions. That's what I mean by active. And we will list those functions, you guys. But just before um, I do that, I also want to describe that this complement um, system, once activated, so we, call, we talk about complement activation, it's often described as an amplifying cascade, amplifying cascade. So, and again, guys, this is very superficial, but let's talk about a cascade. So I think of a cascade like a waterfall or maybe dominoes. And what we mean by cascade, you guys, is let's say, um, I'll just use numbers, you guys, to indicate different complement proteins. So let's say we have a complement, complement protein, and I'll just call it one, okay? So we're going to activate complement protein one by cleaving it in half, right? And then part of its biological function is it's going to activate complement pr pr protein two. And when two is activated, what will it activate? Three. And then three will activate four, and that will activate five. So you guys, this is kind of like the cascade, like a waterfall or a domino. It's like once you push one domino, all the dominoes fall over. Once you activate one complement protein, then all the other uh, complement proteins 
will get activated, so that's the cascade. Amplifying means if I activate one complement protein, it can activate, say, 100 of the next protein. So this is just obvious, you guys. So let's say um, I activate complement protein 1, and it can activate 100 complement proteins too. And then each of those complement proteins can activate three, you know, 100 threes. And each of those threes will activate um, 100 fours. So uh, this is the amplification, right? Starting with a tiny signal and ending up with a huge, huge um, result. So the benefit of this, you guys, is a few invading microbes in activating just a few complement proteins, you can end up with a massive complement response, which can be really protective. Now, folks, complement can be activated nonspecifically. That's what we're talking about right now. Some microbes, when they invade, complement proteins will bind and will automatically get cut into two pieces, right? So that's why we're talking about complement as part of nonspecific defenses. Some microbes, surface molecules, will activate the first complement protein, and that starts the whole cascade. We'll see later that antibodies that bind to microbes can also help activate the complement cascade, but that's like acquired specific defenses, so we'll wait till next Thursday to talk about that. The most important thing is like, well, who cares? Why is this important, right? So you guys, in this cartoon, we can see this is what, and, and, and you don't have to memorize numbers or anything, folks. This is called the terminal pathway. This, this is the um, complement cascade that's activated either nonspecifically or specifically. And what we want to know is, well, tell us how these active complement proteins are going to protect us, right? So you guys, just really quickly, so the activated <coughs> complement proteins will act as inflammatory mediators, right? They're going to increase local inflammation. They're going to help set up those chemical concentration gradients. We call them chemotactic factors. So the cells of the immune system can use the concentration gradient of activated complement to guide them to the scene of invasion. This will be really important, you guys, opsonization. And, and I'll just mention it quickly, and then we'll cartoon it. Opsonization is when we coat an invading microbe with a substance, and, it, and it's like literally, you guys, making the invading microbe sticky. And um, so we talk about opsonization, preparing to eat. And because I love food and I love chocolate, you guys, I think of opsonization like pouring sticky chocolate sauce all over the invading microbes to help make them stickier for phagocytes, right? So when we opsonize a microbe, we're covering it in something to which our, our phagocytes can bind to, and that's going to increase phagocytic killing. And then this last bit here, you guys, we're going to see that activated complement proteins can insert themselves into phospholipid bilayers, in the cell membranes, in the outer membranes, into the envelopes of viruses, and cause pores, which would cause a lot of damage. So you guys, so let me, let me back up here. Let's list those uh, biological properties. So you guys, help me out here. So can you help me? Can you help list the biological protective functions of activated complement? And you can read it off the PowerPoint slide. It's fine, you guys. Inflammation, right? So they're going to help trigger all of those changes that we associate with inflammation, increasing blood flow to the scene of infection, increased delivery of um, phagocytes, right? Um, yes, OK, what else? What's another uh, biological protective function of activated complement? Yeah, good. Chemotactic factors, meaning they help set up that concentration gradient to guide cells of the immune system, guide the phagocytes to the scene of invasion. Awesome, you guys. Now, the next one, you guys, opsonization. Let me see if I can't cartoon this a little bit. OK. So we'll do, we'll do a goofy cartoon here, you guys. So let's say this is our phagocyte. So here's our phagocyte. And here's our invading pathogen. Okay. So remember, you guys, we said for the path, excuse me, for the um, for the phagocytes to be able to ingest the pathogen to destroy it, what does it have to do to the surface? It has to attach, right? And maybe this phagocyte lacks receptors for some unique microbial compound here. So this is the joy, you guys, of complement. So we'll use little C's for complement. 
And yesterday, you guys, I realized C also stands for chocolate. <laughs> okay, sorry. All right, it also stands for chocolate. So when we activate the complement um, cascade, and, and, and the surface of pathogens can, can sometimes activate it, we're going to coat we're going to coat the pathogen in complement. And this process, you guys, of coating the pathogen, this is called opsonization. And it literally means preparing to eat. Who's going to eat them? The phagocytes, yeah, preparing to eat. We're making the pathogen stickier for the phagocyte. So now the opsonized pathogen, now the phagocyte can really attach to it. Why? What does the phagocyte have that permits it to more strongly, readily attach to this complement opsonized pathogen? Pseudopods, but what are on the pseudopods? Receptors. You got it, you guys. So the phagocyte, phagocytes have complement receptors. Does that make sense, you guys? Right? So our phagocytes have complement receptors. Right? So the little C's are the phagocyte complement receptors. So does this make sense, you guys? We coat the micro in complement, and now the phagocyte can use its complement receptors to bind to the complement um, coated, the complement opsonized pathogen. And that's going to greatly increase phagocytic killing. Does that make sense, folks? OK. <laughs> and then, um, oh, OK, you guys, and just for terminology, so then we would call the activated complement, we call them opsonins. They can coat invading pathogens and make it easier for the phagocytes to kill them. Does that make sense? Okay. And folks, this membrane attack complex, as we said, these activated complement proteins can insert themselves into phospholipid bilayers, forming these protein pores. And these protein pores made by complement folks are called the membrane attack complex. So we talk, we talk about MAC attack. And again, I was chocolate, hamburgers, it's all good eating. Okay, so this is the MAC attack. What does MAC stand for, folks? Membrane attack complex. Awesome, you nailed it. Membrane attack complex. So again, the activated complement can insert itself into phospholipid bilayers. Now, where do we find phospholipid bilayers? Cytoplasmic membranes, right? We can actually lyse cellular microbes. We also find phospholipid bilayers, you guys, in the envelopes of viruses. Now, if we damage the envelope of the virus, how does that help us? They can no longer attach to our cells, right? So if we damage the viral envelope, they can't attach to our cells. They can't infect us, right? And another uh, lipid bilayer, you guys, would be the outer membrane of bacteria. So complement can damage the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. And then through the whole of you guys, complement gains entrance and can form membrane attack complexes in the cell membrane of the gram-negative bacteria. So you can get those little guys to just outright lice. Yeah, isn't that amazing? This is such a cool electron micrograph, folks. So this is electron micrograph of a red blood cell, an erythrocyte, and it looks like somebody took a machine gun, right, and just riddled the um, cell membrane with bullets. But you guys, what do you think those bullet holes are? Those are the membrane attack complexes, right? And you can see, you guys, how um, formation of the membrane attack complexes could cause the cellular organisms to just lice outright through, and they're dead. Isn't that amazing? It's so cool. Okay. All right, folks, so we're going to leave complement. We just have one more um, interior nonspecific uh, defense system to look at, and that's interferons. And again, folks, I'm going to take a complicated subject and turn it into a story. And again, I'm oversimplifying, but it's, that's how I remember things is in telling stories. So you guys, I hope you'll bear with me. So you guys, we're going to talk about um, two types of human interferons, alpha and beta interferon. So let me give you some of the conventions up here. Okay. So interferons in those um, three types that we'll talk about. Okay, and they use, um, I think they're Greek symbols. 
for the interference. And you guys, interferon, the abbreviated is IFN. That's for interferon. And um, so the three types are, um, and they, it's IFN, and then you put the, the symbol alpha, alpha interferon, and then IFN beta. And these are the two, you guys, that we'll talk about today, these two. And then, you, and then folks, the third interferon is called um, gamma interferon, and we're going to discuss it as part of the adaptive specific immune response. So we won't talk about gamma interferon today. And we'll, we're going to talk about this later in adaptive immune responses. We're going to see you guys, I, I have to tell you this because it's so amazing. This is one of the chemical messengers that will activate our macrophages to turn them into angry killers, to try to kill those facultative intracellular parasites. And so um, hopefully you guys next Thursday will have enough time to talk about this because it's awesome. Great stuff. So, so today you guys for non-specific, we're going to talk about alpha and beta as part of our uh, non-specific innate defenses against viruses. <clears throat> and the defenses, de defenses, uh, defenses against viruses. Okay. And to do this, you guys, I, I'd like to do some cartooning. Um, so what we want to cartoon is, say, a person that's just gotten infected with a virus. Okay. So would you guys be all right if I raise this? Okay. All right. And we'll come back to this, you guys, next week. Then, oh, damn it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Just one second. Oh, sorry. Okay. <coughs> that didn't help, did it? I think. Okay, I'll leave this part up. I'll, I'm just going to get rid of the gamma. Okay. Okay, is it okay? Good. Okay. All right, you guys, so here's, here's our viral story. So this is a human cell, right? And this poor human cell, you guys, it got invaded by a virus. So I'm just going to use this as my virus, right? So invaded, and the dot on virus is replicating. So this poor little human cell probably isn't long for the world. Okay, but what this little infected cell can do is it can send out a chemical alarm to alert neighboring cells that haven't been infected yet. It's like, you guys, the viruses are invading. You know, lock the doors, get out your weapons, right? So you'll be prepared when the viruses invade. Yeah, so let's show a neighboring cell, you guys, that's not infected. So this is just another neighboring cell, another human cell. So this is so amazing, guys. What this poor little infected cell can do is it can make the um, alpha and beta interferon. So the human cell makes the interferon alpha or beta to signal neighboring cells. Sorry, my pen's going to put on me. Okay. So you guys, so this this infected cell then is going to make what? What's the chemical alarm? The interferon alpha and beta. That's the chemical alarm, right? The cell saying, "I'm going down, but you guys get ready." Yeah. So, so folks, in in this story, let's say these viruses replicate, and let's say they kill this cell, right? So now they're on their way to the neighboring cell. Because the infected cell produced a chemical alarm, the alpha and beta interferon, that alerted this cell to start making what uh, proteins called antiviral proteins. So the um, alpha and beta interferon, the, so the interferon alpha and beta trigger the neighboring cells to make these cool proteins, you guys, I'll put them in red, called antiviral proteins. AVPs, right, because we're so bad. We're just, as biologists, we're, we're always using it. So AVPs, you guys, we'll use them as little red dots here. Okay. So in response to the alpha and beta alarm, this cell that's not yet infected starts making AVPs like crazy. And this is crucial, you guys, because the AVPs have to be made before what happens? Before 
the viruses invade, right? It's almost like having your weapons out, you know, before the, before the, um, the invader comes in. So you guys, what, what makes this awesome then is when these viruses invade, because the AVPs are already ready, they're going to stop the replication of that virus. Even if it gets into the cell, now it can't make copies of itself. So the AVPs, the AVPs will stop viral replication. Isn't that amazing, you guys? So let me see if I put some details here. Right, so what the AVPs can do, they can degrade the viral mRNA. They can bind to and stop ribosomes from making viral proteins, right? So the AVPs, they have to be made ahead of time. As soon as the virus gets into the cell, then those AVPs will make sure that virus cannot replicate. Yeah, and if no virus replication, no damage to the cell, and then the virus can't continue to spread. So isn't that amazing? Okay, but of course, you guys, there's problems. And the problems are not all cells can make interferon alpha and beta. Of course, that would be way too easy, huh? And the second problem is, you guys, not all viruses will trigger alpha and beta interferon production. But you guys, did you see just with innate defenses how many different strategies our bodies have evolved to protect us? So it's not like any one strategy will protect us against all the pathogens. We have multiple different strategies, and hopefully in combination, they'll, they'll, they'll help us survive, right? Hopefully help us survive and hopefully in relatively good health using all these different strategies against this wide range of microbes. Okay, so you guys, let me just take a look at your, at your um, study guide here. So, oh, and you guys, I do apologize. On page two of the study guide, there's a typo. See where it says 11 complement activation? And if you go down there, it says role of alpha and beta interferon. There should be a number there, right? So that should have been 12. So, folks, that next one, um, iron binding proteins, excuse me, sorry, Siderophores. I won't ask you about iron, iron binding, I will not ask you about iron binding proteins on exam three, okay, so we'll just leave it at that. And then um, the last one there, you guys, we did talk a little bit about endotoxic shock and how um, it really does represent an inappropriate inflammatory response with the release of this storm of um, chemical metabolic the cytokines that cause all the changes that can lead to our death. Okay. So, folks, I'm so sorry. I'm just pushing this so fast. Um, what I realized was I needed one more lecture to do a good job on um, the adaptive um, specific immune responses right in the semester's over. So you guys, I'm going to leave the innate nonspecific defenses because I want to get just one concept under our belts dealing with the adaptive acquired immune response, which is the last, last, last PowerPoint of the course, okay? So you guys, so with apologies, what we're going to do is just start the very last PowerPoint. And this is on the second branch of the immune system, the adaptive acquired specific immune responses. These are our big guns. These are our big cannons, OK? So we'll just do a little introduction here. And my hope is, is that if we learn nothing else about the adaptive acquired specific immune response, <coughs> excuse me, that we'll have an understanding of the cru crucial role of T helper lymphocytes, how they are the most important cell of the adaptive immune system. And so we can understand why it is that if, say, I get infected with HIV, and my HIV starts infecting and destroying my T helper lymphocytes, why it is that this can lead to my immune system becoming totally crippled, right? And how it is that I can develop AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency, um, syndrome through the destruction of my T helper lymphocytes, right? So if you don't get anything else out of this unit, I hope you'll get that key role of T helper lymphocytes. So you guys, so we'll just do a quick little introduction here. Obviously, we won't get through this whole thing, but um, what we'll do is we'll finish this PowerPoint next Thursday after we take our lecture exam three on Tuesday, okay? So I think we can get through kind of the key points here. All right, guys, so this is the second arm of our immune system. Like I, I said, the big guns. 
And this is the, it, it's had so many names, you guys, since I started college. Um, so it's called um, Adaptive Acquired Specific Immunity. And all, all of those descriptions are, are important. So let's see if we can't figure out what the heck all those adjectives mean. Okay. So our first line of defenses, you guys, were those nonspecific innate defenses. Right, the surface defenses of skin and mucous membranes, and we just finished the interior defenses. Right, so the question is, well, what, what if it's a microbe that has a lot of virulence factors, and none of these defenses can stop it, right? It's still, still causing infection, say, 10 to 14 days later. Well, the nonspecific defenses you guys will protect us, maybe at least try to hold the microbes in one area of the body, <clears throat> maybe, maybe hopefully prevent them from spreading throughout our body. Um, and that's going to give um, time for activation of, again, you guys, it's called the adaptive acquired specific um, immunity or a host defenses. And again, you guys, this is the most powerful arm of the immune system, but there's a big disadvantage to it. There's a lag period. It's slow, right? So initially, it takes about 10 to 14 days to get it activated. And of course, we could die in that time, right? So you guys, what's protecting us? This, right? The nonspecific defenses are protecting us until we get our big guns in position to get them activated. Okay. So, now the reason it's called adaptive because it lets us adapt to the pathogens in our environment, right? It's acquired because it's not always on. We have to be exposed to the pathogen or the toxin before um, this arm of the immune system will be activated. And again, you guys, it takes, it takes a while for it to become activated. It's specific because unlike non-specific and eight defenses, it's only specific for a given pathogen or a given toxin, right? Right. So again, you guys, it's specific for a pathogen or toxin. And again, you guys, this is a huge disadvantage, that life period, taking 10 to 14 days before we get it activated, yeah? But you guys, this is the huge, 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 huge benefit of the specific immune system. And that is we're gonna make what are called memory cells. And these memory cells are going to remember that pathogen. They're going to remember that toxin. So that if ever you're subsequently infected by the pathogen or are exposed to the toxin, those memory cells are rapidly going to be activated. And we're going to have a faster, stronger, longer lasting, more effective, what we call secondary immune response. And it's these memory cells, you guys, this secondary immune response that's a basis for lifelong immunity against a pathogen. Like in the old days, if we had survived smallpox as kids, we would never get smallpox again because of our memory cells. It's also, you guys, the basis of vaccination. One of the things we're trying to do when we vaccinate our kids and we vaccinate ourselves, we're trying to make those memory cells so that if we ever encounter the live virulent pathogen or if we're ever exposed to that you know, really virulent exotoxin, these memory cells will be instantly activated and protect us from dying, right? They might not totally prevent the infection, but they'll, they'll protect us from making sure um, that no serious harm comes to us, protects us from dying, right? So these memory cells are amazing. Yeah, and do remember you guys, innate nonspecific defenses, there's no memory. It's always the same response over and over and over again, yeah, okay. <clears throat> And then, folks, there's two arms of adaptive specific immunity. Humoral immunity, humoral means fluids, and it's in our fluids, our body fluids, that we find antibodies, also known as immunoglobulins. And you guys, for us, for our course, for the final exam, and this is information, guys, on the final exam, not on exam three, we're going to say that antibodies provide protection primarily against extracellular pathogens, extracellular toxins, right? And the reason is, you guys, once a toxin gets into our cell, once a pathogen gets into our cells, the antibodies can no longer reach them, right? And then, folks, the second arm of the adaptive specific immune response is what's called CMI, for cell-mediated immunity. 
This is the arm of our immune system that will help protect us against intracellular pathogens like viruses, right? Once the viruses get into our cells, our antibodies can't reach them. So cell-mediated immunity, these are cells of the immune system that can recognize which of our cells have been infected, and then CMI will kill those cells. Why is that helpful? That doesn't sound very protective, does it? But you guys, if we have a cell infected with a virus and our CMI kills that cell, why is that helpful? The virus can't replicate, right? So if you can kill the first cells that are infected with viruses, the viruses can't replicate, right? You're going to stop infection and, and stop, you know, lots of damage. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So you guys, so what, um, what, again, you guys, if you've learned nothing else from this unit, we want to explore the crucial key role of T helper lymphocytes, also called CD4 positive T helpers. And to do this, you guys, what I'd like to do is make a kind of a big cartoon up here with our T helpers as the central players and see what crucial roles they play in both humoral immunity and cell mediated immunity. So you guys, so what we'll do, we might not get finished, that's okay. What I'm going to do, I would suggest you guys we start with a new piece of paper and put it landscape version, right? And again, folks, the uh, adaptive immune system won't be on exam three. It will be on the final exam, okay? So this is all information for the final exam. So, folks, here what we're going to do is we're going to look at the key role of T helper lymphocytes. And again, folks, they have a specific surface molecule called the CD4 molecule, so they're often referred to as CD4 positive T helpers or T lymphocytes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we can do um, an abbreviation T with subset H or T subset um, uh, subscript H is these T helpers, okay? So you guys, I'm going to put my T helper in the middle of my <clears throat> specific adaptive immune system here. So here's my CD4 positive T helper. And I'm going to divide my immune system, you guys, into two halves. So over here is going to be humoral immunity. This is protection provided by antibodies, also known as immunoglobulins. And then, folks, over on the other side is going to be my CMI. And what does that stand for? Cell-mediated, yeah. And in cell-mediated immunity, folks, I'm going to have two players. <clears throat> so I'm going to have CD8-positive cytotoxic mm -hmm. lymphocyte. And then down here, you guys, I'm going to have my macrophage. Okay, so folks, let's first focus on um, humoral immunity, okay, and how T helpers are involved. So some, some more cartooning days. So um, these T helpers are going to make chemical messengers, and we're just going to call them generically, you guys, T helper cytokines. And it's these T helper cytokines that, that um, the T helpers use to communicate with all the other cells of the specific immune system, right? So we're going to cartoon it, you guys, the T helpers making cytokines. We're just going to have an arrow like this, and this represents the T helper cytokines. All right. So folks, let's first take a look at how T helpers are involved in coordinating um, antibody production, okay? So you guys, help me out here. Um, those of you in a &P, can you tell me which cells in our body make antibodies? Good, B lymphocytes. Good, you guys, so you can call them B cells or B lymphocytes. Okay, so these are the cells that are going to make antibodies. Now, they need two triggers to do a really good job making antibodies. Um, one trigger is they're going to they're gonna come into contact with a pathogen. So this is a trigger, okay, is one trigger for the B lymphocytes, and, and we'll describe the process later, you guys. But the other trigger, the other signal the B lymphocytes need to make really good antibodies is what? Yeah, there you go, you guys. We need T helper cytokines. 
The D helpers have to be there to provide the chemical messengers so the B lymphocytes can do the best job making antibodies. Now, what do I mean the best job making antibodies? So, these B lymphocytes, they're going to make the antibodies. And folks, we'll discover next Thursday there's different classes of antibodies. And the best class of antibody, the, the antibody that carries out all the protective functions, the only antibody that mom can pass to her baby across the placenta is called the IgG antibody. That's our goal. We want our B lymphocytes to make IgG antibodies. But the problem is when they're first triggered, when they first encounter a microbial antigen, they start making this other antibody that's okay. I don't mean to disrespect it, it's just not the best. So B lymphocytes, they first make this great big antibody called IgM. Now IgM doesn't do all the protective functions. It's big, it's hard for it to get out of the blood vessels. It can't cross the placenta. So you guys, which antibody would we like our B cells to switch to making? IgG. So this is called class switching, you guys. And guess what's required? What's your guess? T helper cytokines, right? So it turns out, you guys, your B lymphocytes will get stuck making IgM unless they get which signal? T helper cytokines, right? Okay, the B lymphocytes will just get stuck making this okay antibody, not the best, unless the T helpers are there giving them chemical messenger. And you guys, just in the last minute, what's the other thing that we want to make always, always? You got it, you guys. We want to make B memory cells. And we can only make B memory cells with the help of what? Yeah. So the B, the B cells can't make memory cells unless they have T helper cytokines. And we'll come back to you guys next Thursday and describe what's the problem if we don't get memory cells made. Okay? So you guys, what we'll do then, um, Tuesday is lecture exam three. A week from today, Thursday is our last lecture exam. So we'll finish our map here. And then we'll just look, we're going to focus primarily on antibodies. We'll talk about the different types of antibodies, what they do. Um, we'll talk about the primary and secondary immune responses. And then you guys will just very, very, very lightly talk about CMI. Okay, and then we'll be through it. Isn't that amazing? That's great. Okay, so you guys in the, um, you guys, you guys, this is important. In the one, in the um, one p.m. lab, if any of you guys want to start early, I'll try to be there at. Um, sure. Um, I'll try to.